80, 90 million people, a big complex society with industrial capacity and so on. But Iran is the one independent state there that is seen as the big threat to Israel and to the US in terms of plans to pacify or, or subjugate the entire region. Sorry, Tim. Um, just in terms of, uh, and I'm thinking very, very currently, uh, I think the, the role of, of Turkey at the moment is, is sort of quite interesting, I think, because if you stand back and look at it, you'd think, oh, you know, they're standing up for, for the Muslims at all. But to me, it seems like a very bizarre sort of almost playing into the hand of sort of a Zionist conspiracy where they are trying to inflame certain tensions. The Sunni Shia sort of war didn't really go to plan. Uh, I mean, it did, I guess, for a little while for when, when ISIS was at its peak, but that sort of dissipated now. So now they just seem to be playing into the hands of, well, creating another uh, countervailing force to fight against. And I, I, I'm very suspicious of that. Do, do you agree with that in terms of this context? Yeah, I think the idea of a countervailing force is a good one. This is a, an institutional liberal idea which is very useful sometimes, you know, that Turkey is there in a, uh, in a, in a different capacity um, because it's part of NATO, it's been linked to NATO for a long time, so it's, it's engagement with Europe, with Europe and the US, or really the US. Well, I think with Israel as well, do you agree? I mean, they, they and, do and military with, uh, exercises together. They... And with Israel, because you know, the, the NATO, well, effectively Israel is an asset of NATO. Right. I mean, in, Israel has its own momentum, its own Zionist momentum, but effectively it's there because it serves a purpose for the imperial power and its main allies. And that, that is to say, it's, a, it's an element in the region which strategically placed, which helps them. So Israel is important for that reason too, that it helps divide the region and, and have an agent there, which is... So with Turkey, of course, you know, there's another game going on because we can't fully understand Turkey until we see what's going on with Russia and Europe or let's say NATO in Europe. And that makes things a little more complicated because you're looking at the global situation. You know that empires typically um, are jealous of the next big threat to come along. They don't really care about little people, uh, big powers. They are worried about the threat and that's why the hysteria over China and Russia basically. And with the Middle East generally, I think it's fair to say that the concern about dominating a region is precisely to stop other big powers from having a similar role and being able to determine their terms of access. So who are the, the threats to the US and the Middle East, basically? If they see themselves as dominating the region, they want to exclude Russia, they want to exclude China, and they also want to exclude the possibility of an independent European relationship to the Middle East and to Russia. Hence, you know, Zabrinsky's uh, uh, theory of um, the... Sorry? Grand chessboard. The, the use of these Eastern European countries to stop a normal relation between Russia and Europe is because if you have a normal relation between Russia and Europe, what's the point of the US being in Europe and being in NATO? Its role diminishes massively. <coughs> if you have normal is that relations. Same now with, with Iran and Europe as well, because if Europe doesn't seem to have the same uh, resistance to Iran that, that the United States does. That's right. Well, that division has opened up recently, you know, after the nuclear agreement, whereas, uh, what, 10 years ago, you had not just Europe, but you had Russia and China all against Iran. Iran was in a very difficult situation. Not going to be repeated. That's all changed now, basically. But globally, you've got this process of Eurasian integration, which is also a big threat. So the US is against that because, and, and going back to the Korean case, you know, the South Koreans, 82% of them want reunification with the, the North, you know, one country, two systems type of thing. Um, what happens to the US in that case? What's the point of the US being there? And the US is there to have a toehold in Asia because of trying to uh, have a role in relation to China. So some of these things we're talking about are now getting into the bigger chessboard, into the global sort of scene, you know, which where things become a little bit more complicated. But I think in principle, the idea of, a, of, of an imperial power is to dominate and exclude other potential rivals. It is not to say that Russia and China are imperialist powers in that sense, just because the US is paranoid. Of them. It means that's the way a big power thinks, basically. Uh, in terms of the Middle East, but yeah, Turkey is in a, in a different position, and now there's this game with Russia and Turkey, which is um, 
important because in the long run for Syria, for example, which has an 800-kilometre border with Turkey, there has to be some sort of relationship at some stage with Turkey. Never mind Erdogan, after Erdogan at some stage there has to be a relationship with Turkey. And Iran understands that, that's why Iran, although you know, the Muslim Brotherhood and Iran, there's, there's ideological, terrible you know, differences there, but in a diplomatic sense, Iran goes beyond that and doesn't, uh, and, and therefore was able to take advantage of the split between Qatar and Saudi Arabia, because even though the ideology of Qatar is vicious against Shia Muslims, but nevertheless, <coughs> Iran was positioned to take advantage of that, that particular spat. Anyway, the point of all that was, yeah, you've got three big countries in the region, Turkey, Egypt, and Iran, but Iran is the only one that everyone recognises with the capacity to oppose at some cost, at some considerable cost to itself, because it is no doubt damaging the Iranian economy, these sanctions, but now um, it's a different ballgame, isn't it, that the US is trying to impose the sanctions, impose the sanctions on third parties, which, by the way, the the role of sanctions in the world has increased massively um, in the last, say, 30 years, at a time when initially the idea of free trade was being pushed by the same big powers. <laughs> and now, with sanctions against dozens of countries, it's the most illiberal outcome you can imagine, including the sanctions which are fairly illegal against third parties. Now, in relation to Cuba and Iran, for example, I've done some calculations. With Obama, uh, the economic war increased substantially. In the last year of Bush, uh, you know, the, the sanctions against Cuba used to be someone got caught with some Cuban cigars taken to the US, they got fined $1,000. So the last year of Bush, 2008, the total sanctions by OFAC, the Office of Foreign Asset Control in the, in the US Department of Treasury, were $3 million. $3 million. Since then, Beginning in 2009, I think in 2009, the total sanctions were $700 million. And on, on many individual, mainly European banks, the sanctions have been 200, 300, 500, in one case, $900 million fines on third parties for breaching US unilateral sanctions against typically Cuba, Iran, maybe Burma and um, Sudan, a couple of other countries, but mainly. So, the, the aggravation, the damage that US unilateral sanctions is doing to Europe, Europe also has unilateral sanctions. <laughs> um, that's why the United Nations has a special rapporteur looking at the damage being done by sanctions. His name's Idris, he's an Arab man, Idris, uh, I forget his last name basically, I'm in the office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, looking at the damaging impact of sanctions, or the economic war effectively, because most of them are are illegal these days. There's another aspect of hybrid war, basically. So the smart power interventions are trying to leverage those other, what used to be called soft power, you know, like propaganda, economic war, um, use of proxy armies, use of terrorism, use of Al-Qaeda type groups, where appropriate, you know, where there is, they can play on some division. There wasn't a division between Muslims in Lebanon in, in the civil war. There was no Sunni Shia thing in, in the Civil War. It was sort of the Christians who had a privileged position there and, and the Muslims. Um, that was manufactured, largely speaking, after the Iranian Revolution. So uh, that smart power idea, I think the US Democrats sort of claim it for their own, more or less, uh, and occupations as a backup, basically. So what we have today in terms of the propaganda wars, which has always struck me as incredibly surprising how powerful the propaganda is, considering that we do have the internet, we do have other resources these days um, that didn't exist 20 years ago, for example. But the, part of the explanation must be that there is a big consensus between <coughs> the two big factions in Western or imperial cultures about these wars. The liberals, by and large, and the realists agree, and this applies as much in Australia as it does in the US, basically, they agree on the idea of uh, the need to remove the independent will, to demonise the Palestinian resistance, or the effective Palestinian resistance, to demonise the Lebanese resistance, to demonise every other leader as a brutal dictator who's killing his own people in, from Iraq to Syria to whether or not they are. 
doesn't matter because that's from Venezuela now. You know. <coughs> of course, the interventions in Latin America have a, have a longer history there. But this smart power idea is being applied uh, and the, both the major factions of politics in the US and in Australia support. Uh, even in this country, I think, no, one, no, no politician stuck out their neck over even the invasion of Iraq. There was some substantial opposition to the invasion of Iraq at a popular level. Uh, but with the major parties, no. Even in, even in Britain, some of those people resigned from the Labour Party, for example. But none of them here. They wanted their job so badly that they didn't resign here, basically. Um, so there is this consensus. Uh, and that consensus, of course, is integrated with the, the monopoly power, which typically controls the media. Um, that is to say, the interlocking investment groups in this country Finance and mining, in particular, are particularly strong. Um, they are invested into the, the media. Um, of course, it's an, it's an international business too. It's not simply a domestic thing. So, in many respects, those investment groups have a lot of power over the um, over the political parties. In any case, but there is this consensus about um, exceptionalist interventions. Exceptionalism is just a North American way of talking about. Well, the, the same laws don't apply to us as apply to everyone else, basically, because we are the moral example of the light on the hill that's going to lead the world and so on. Hegemonic stability, the single superpower ideas coming back. In. So I'm coming back to the point that I, I mentioned before. Resistance in that context, when we talk about imperialism, is to talk about theory of power. And I would argue that it's in terms of the former colonies that are facing these pressures more directly, the fundamental contradiction there is imperialism versus independence, because it's not possible to construct social structures, social alternatives under attack in that sort of way. It's not possible when, you, when your hospitals are being destroyed, when your schools are being destroyed and so on. Uh, there has to be some body politics. So the, 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 the principal contradiction in these circumstances has to be independence. Resistance has certain characters in relation to those projects of domination, but um, it's not an idealistic sense. And I think a lot of Western leftists don't really understand this because they are stuck with idealistic approaches to resistance. And they say, well, you know, if this government matches to our ideals of what we think a future socialism should be, then we'll support it. And if it doesn't, then we won't support it. But that's not solidarity for me, basically. People are resisting because they are defending their, their, their lives, their communities, their nations, um, uh, often their lives and, and their families' lives too. And that resistance necessarily, in terms of historical materialism, in terms of the way the Latin Americans see it, the Latin Americans have one principle that says that we cannot copy forms of social organisation from the Europeans. We have to build it and account. In, in the basis of our own historical experience. This is something that's got 200 years of tradition in post-colonial literature in, in Latin America from, uh, uh, from in Venezuela, Simon Rodriguez in the early 19th century, one of the teachers of Simon Bolivar in Jose Martí in Cuba, Carlos Maria Tegui in Peru in the 1920s, who was a friend of Antonio Gramsci, and Chavez and Fidel of, of our era, they constantly spoke on that, that we have to build our own reality based on our own historical roots. We can't copy it from others. But Marty said that we build our own Greece because Greece was the, you know, the, the old 19th century European ideal of democracy was the Greek democracy, whatever Greek democracy was at the time. It was a slave society too, of course. So uh, in that sense, resistance has physical circumstances and also cultural circumstances. and. Uh, uh, it has to be, it varies significantly um, from place to place. Talk about Iran, basically. Um, and the, the principle I mentioned before, the Latin Americans, the other principle was that they, they saw that, that, as Marti said 120 something years ago, the trees have to form ranks so that the giant with the seven league boots can't walk through the forest, basically. Words. The little countries can't resist Spain. They couldn't resist North America. They had to come together to resist it. And the legacy of Hugo Chavez was to create um, UNASUR, which now the, the, the president of 
the traitorous president of Ecuador is trying to escape from. There's even a, a base, an office of UNASUR in, in Quito. Um, and sell up the, the community of Latin American Caribbean nations, um, which included all of the 33 Caribbean and Latin American countries, 600 million people. Um, it was when Cuba was president of the CELAC in 2013 that the Obama administration said, that, um, we tried to isolate Cuba and now we're isolated in the Americas. And the following year, um, no coincidence, that's why Obama went to Cuba and walked the streets of Havana and something I discovered a few months ago in Havana was Despite the fact that Trump's tried to roll back the, the US tourism in Cuba, there's a lot of North Americans still there, and a lot of them are African American because they saw Obama walking through the streets of Havana. It had a big impact on them, and that there's still this, um, this strong effect there. It's, it's very close to the US. So, uh, resistance can only succeed through combination and um, unity, is what the Latins are saying. And one other thing I might mention, because Mia and I were talking about, Mia's been studying the, the Caucasus. You know, if you, see, if you look at the map of the Caucasus these days, it's very complicated. I don't know if you ever look at the map to see the divisions in Sapasetia and the little enclave in um, those countries. But uh, little people who are divided um, become very weak. They have very few possibilities. They get easily manipulated. Okay, here's a scorecard of imperialism in the Middle East to finish on. But of course, we've just got time for more comments. Um, if the report card was, how is Washington going? In the plan it began in 2001, by the way I saw a, a documentary this morning um, by a group called South Front on the uh, special operations, the US special operations forces which were put into place in a range of countries, not just the Middle East, in, to a large extent in Europe and Africa, and they've expanded enormously, uh, enormously in the last 18 years, um, supposedly in the name of the war on terror. There's more ter terrorism now than there was back then, um, but the Special Operations Forces are in dozens and dozens of countries, and they've expanded hugely. So it's an it's a industry, as I said before, Imperialism stimulates war economies, and of course, having the presence in those countries is some attempt. Interesting. I'm not, I'm not going to go into. I'm not going to go into this, but the fact that the U.S. economy has been failing in the last three decades in terms of trade and industry, and of course, we know the rise of industrial power in East Asia and so on, um, is happening at the same time as these increasingly increasingly aggressive moves to try and capture markets and to try and control the terms of access and to control uh, the rents on technology and so on. Um, there's this uh, very illiberal uh, reaction by the US, which includes um, special forces deployment in, in many, many countries. Um, at the same time, the, the report card doesn't look very good. OK, they destroyed Libya. In a sense, they've removed for the foreseeable future, a little country which had an independent politics, which people criticise Libya and Gaddafi for different reasons and so on, for different compromises, but um, there were still independent elements in Libya which were, for example, not integrated within AFRICOM, within the, the Pentagon's plan for North Africa, and um, had its own plans for an African currency within the African Union and so on. So there were significant independent elements uh, of the body politics still in Libya at the time it was destroyed. Now, in that sense, they've succeeded. Um, they're failing in Syria, but they're, they're trying to... The, the occupations are... They're, they're moving some of the terrorist groups across to Iraq and to Afghanistan to try and keep them for assets against Iran, basically, but the occupation points are really, as I've said, to try and keep Iraq and Syria divided to prevent uh, a decent integration, which has been attempted for a number of years, by the way. There are good uh, relations, but of course, physically, they're being obstructed between Iraq and, and Syria. Firstly, in security, and then you, know, you haven't got security, you haven't got trade, you haven't got other things going on. Uh, the restoration of culture, the rest of restoration of historic culture, also a range of things. The restoration of tourism, although I noticed that in Syria now, um, there's some European groups that are declaring Syria safe for tourism, so long as you stay away from Idlib and east of the Euphrates. Um, 
with Iran, of course, there is this aggression by Trump, renewed aggression by Trump, but it's not really working because Iran, 40 years after its revolution, is actually stronger than it's ever been before, effectively, and this is what why it bothers them so much. And do a search, if you like, for this expression, Iran land bridge. <laughs> Probably, you know, maybe you've never come across it before, but it absolutely obsesses Israeli intelligence and, and the US. It's also called the Crescent. Sorry? It's also called the Crescent, the Shia Crescent. The Shia Crescent, it's yes. a, a Saudi Arabian sort of invention too. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> the, the new version of it is the, the Iranian land bridge. Um, the Pentagon had a little red team which developed these things. One of them was Persians against Arabs. Before they did the Shia Sunni thing, they tried the Persians against Arabs thing, and then they went the Shia Sunni thing. Um, in Lebanon, Lebanon gained some political will in recent times. I mean, Lebanon, which was set up to be a weak state, which to, set up to fail effectively, to be divided formally in, in, in sectarian terms. They, a nice expression for it is a confessional state, because people are divided in religions, but it's breaking down to a degree. To a degree. It's still there through the type of cause and so on, but there is a significant challenge to that. All of the increased influence of the resistance in Lebanon, which is led by Hezbollah, is largely outside the Shia communities because they already had 99% support of the Shia community. So the increased influence of Hezbollah in, in Lebanon in recent times and in the government recently, regardless of the fact that Britain just decided to up the, the banning on Lebanon, is because the influence of what they now call more properly the resistance is more particularly in Sunni Muslim and, and Christian areas, basically. That's where they, their partners are. Uh, giving Hezbollah well stronger, and the relationship between progressive Christians and and, uh, and the Shia is, is much stronger too. So Lebanon is in a better position now than it's been for some time. Iraq has had a weak state, still got a weak state with a lot of problems of corruption and so on, but nevertheless the formation of the Hashd al-Shabi, the, the popular resistance or the, the sort of a vague sort of parallel to Hezbollah and Iraq was what stopped ISIS dash from destroying Iraq, basically. And everyone in Iraq knows that, and people in all communities in Iraq will tell you that. Um, but, of course, the US doesn't want to admit that, basically, because they're the ones that have meant to uh, liberate Iraq from, from Daesh. So, there's a slow process, I suggest, of Iraq recovering political will, joining with its neighbours. Um, there's no real there's no real difference in Iraq in terms of having good relationships with Iran and with Syria. But the difference in Iraq is mainly which of the forces there have the political will to go against the Americans. Isn't the US renewed its sanctions on Iraq recently? The US has got sanctions on certain groups in Iraq. Um, so one of them is the, the equivalent of Hezbollah. And there's two of them. I think there's two. There might be more than two. Uh, more, than, more than two. Uh, there's uh, uh, Kabi, which is uh, that Sheikh has been speaking about ejecting the US from Iraq yes. for the last three years, but they're trying to do it you know, politically in some way you know, before uh, a direct conflict. But essentially, they're all groups that are that have close relationships with the with Iran, with Iran, with Iran military, basically. So, um, and of course, the same with Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. And that way. Afghanistan, you see, they can't defeat Afghanistan. Um, uh, and what do you think of the Taliban? They are indigenous in a way that Daesh is not indigenous to the Syrian Iraq. So. Uh, it's not very hopeful in terms of um, in terms of the U, what the U.S. is trying to do, except to this extent, if they um, they can distract people for a period of years, they can keep the war going. They can't win, but they can keep the conflict going and keep people weak in that sort of, in that way. In that sense, that's why the, the the resistance is so important, and why the links between the resistance are so important, and that's why the role of Iran is so important too, because effectively. Um, there's no other state with the capacity and the will to to do that sort of coordination role, and that's uh, play that coordination role. And, and of course, precisely why you hear the, the fears of Israel of having Iran at its border, you know, oh, maybe Syria doesn't need Iran at its border <laughs> because that's um, 
that's what like BMRs effectively that will end up with a strength of axis of resistance in the region as a result of these wars which have been terrible. Tim, is there an opposing argument to this? An opposing argument to, to this report card? Yeah. Well, the language what would the Americans say? The language is different. I said <laughs> I've ignored democracy and humanitarian motives because they're pretexts more or less. The problem, the problem with that is, is if we talk about imperialism, we follow the logic of imperialism. So yeah, I'm giving you, I'm particularly in this graph, when I didn't tell you about hegemonic stability theory and the others before, basically. Um, but the problem with hegemonic stability, the problem with humanitarian interventions is, if we absorb them, we derail our discussion of imperialism. So in other words, okay, let's talk about humanitarian motives, humanitarian intervention, humanitarian war, let's talk about hegemonic stability theory and so on. But then it shouldn't stop us talking about imperialism. But that's what is intended, effectively. Hegemonic stability theory says there is no imperial power. There is a hegemonic power, and you all have public goods for it. You can't criticise... No, you can criticise power, but you can't reconstruct its meaning in a way. You know what I mean, you can, for example, in society, in my, in my former university, you can criticise Israel, you can criticise uh, Washington, you can criticise Trump, you can criticise Netanyahu, but you can't <coughs> support the logic of the resistance. <laughs> they don't want you to go and wave the Hezbollah flag in the streets of... Sydney. And they've got people intimidated and people don't do it, by and large. Tim, you've identified the US as the number one enemy in the world's people. You're talking about resistance. What can we do here? We've got US bases. We've got US study centres. Every time we get a Prime Minister, they run over to Washington, get anointed. Uh, we've got Foxtel. All we've got to do is say, they're the number one enemy of the world's people out of Australia, that's what we can do to help, you know, defeat the US. Yeah, the US study centre, I noticed the student paper at Sydney just published that they have got some direct funding from the US State Department now too. Before um, they didn't, there was Australian government there's money. There's two or three of them, there's one in Perth, there's one in Sydney, I don't know, there's one in Melbourne, and they're, well, they're everywhere. They're, well, in, they're soft in, now. there's a number of things going on. We've got Zionist funding bodies, we've got US government funding things in the university. <laughs> Remember the US Study Centre was set up specifically because Rupert Murdoch got a fright in 2005 when an opinion poll found that Australian, that ordinary Australians, as, you know, as, what let's say, what, amotivated as they might be, found that George W. Bush was a greater threat to the world than Osama bin Laden. And that gave them a shock. And so he called in the Australian policy and said, what are we going to do about this? And they created a US Study Centre, which is sort of, been a small, low-level operation, but they're worried about that. But then, um, they, remember there's this Ramsey Centre, which is billions of dollars from some guy who made a huge amount of money out of private health insurance, probably sucking in a lot of public money uh, as he was doing it, um, to fund uh, courses in Western civilization. Now, um, the, the ANU rejected it. The uh, Sydney has faced a battle where the managers want them, desperately want the money, but a lot of the staff are against it, that uh, they're a bit passive too, you know. Now, the, the managers at the University of Wollongong accepted, and accepted it, but only in the last couple of days, the Senate, which is the governing body of the University of Wollongong, rejected it, which is very unusual. It's very unusual for a governing body to go against the executives. So there's resistance for you. People are talking about these things, and bring up our children, teach them colonial history, Western civilization, and get rid of people like me, basically, who talk about imperialism. Um, there's resistance going on, basically, at, at a local level. Are they? Yeah. Just on Afghanistan, resistance uh, the Taliban. Um, isn't the Taliban initially a creature of the CIA, of US imperialism? Yes, well, yes and no, because um, it's true that they encouraged um, um, the creation of militia in, in, in schools, in Islamic schools in Pakistan, um, to oppose the Soviets in, in Afghanistan. But, uh, and I don't think maybe the Taliban is too simple a term, but there is an indigenous um, 
Islamic resistance in Afghanistan, um, whether we like it or not. Um, and they have been involved in a struggle with ISIS there. And you may have read that there was an incident recently where the US helped spring a number of ISIS fighters from a, a Taliban jail because they control a lot of the rural areas in, in Afghanistan. So this is, I think, we've got to recognise that resistance is formed in particular circumstances, and particular circumstances in Afghanistan mean that we haven't got a strong secular resistance. Uh, you could say the same about Iran with the Iranian revolution in, in a sense, that because they crushed, in the 1950s, when there was a coup in Iran, and the, the regime of the Shah and his secret police, backed by the US, crushed the social democratic secular resistance mm. in Iran, it meant that the resistance to the US in the 70s was overwhelmingly organised through the mosques, and through the and, and therefore the character of the Iranian Revolution, I would say, this is my argument. Uh, Hashim Hussein may have a different view, but is the character of the Iranian Revolution in 1979 was more Islamic because of the crushing of the, the secular political opposition in Iran. And I would say a similar thing about Afghanistan. That the historical circumstances there are that you have a much more uh, a stronger Islamist tradition in the resistance there than you would have had in the 70s, for example, um, because of what's happened, what's happened in that period of time, basically. Those societies have changed. Um, just on the Ramsey Centre, I think it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that just yesterday a headline popped up um, from the Sydney Morning Herald that says, everything Tarrant identifies as true, Ramsey Centre under fire for speakers. So they've been saying some really controversial things. So they, they have Ramsey Centre coming in and they get rid, get rid of people like Tim, which hurts me because uh, he was my supervisor at Sydney University, but I wanted to talk about um, <coughs> uh, one of the, the obstacles that I find, because the, the gentleman previously asked what is it that we can do, and in my lifetime it's, it's been really, really sad to see that in 2003 a million people went out to march against the invasion of Iraq. Back then when I used to engage with leftists who were much older than me, they understood like conflicts in the Middle East, they knew like about Iraq and they could tell you about the resistance and things like that. Today, unfortunately, I mean, if you speak to a lot of like leftists, even universities where they're supposed to be, you know, the most educated and, and conscious about these things, um, you'd be, some of them might not even know where Iraq is on the map. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious about that. So the level of education is actually really, really low. Um, a lot of them uh, sat out of, on, on the war on Syria, didn't take a position on it because of all the confusion, and that brings me to my question. A lot of um, the, the, the left that did take a position on Syria and Libya, the ones that, that turned against us, unfortunately, um, they would say, well, you're just uh, siding with one imperial power over another. What about Russia? What about China? What about Iran? Are they not also imperialists? And one of the, the, the reasons they make for this is because I would, uh, the reason why I'm asking this question is because um, the concept of imperialism that they allude to is the concept of inter-imperialist war, which is a conceptualization where you have multiple imperial powers fighting against each other, but in that conceptualization, there's no question about what the imperial power does to the, the countries that it colonizes. So that dynam dynamic is completely missing. So how would you address the question of Russia, China, and Iran being equal imperial powers with the United States. Thank you. Well, you can address it with evidence, or you can talk about it historically. You know, they're, they're trying to replicate Lenin's argument in the First World War, where you undoubtedly had historical European empires, uh, the Austro-Hungarian and the British and the Russian and so on, that had empires and their satellites and they acted like empires. And um, Russia today and China today are certainly big powers and they have global ambitions, but just on the evidence, you, you, you know, they haven't got 900 foreign military bases, they haven't been involved in invasions. Yes, China is buying itself influence and resources. Yes, Russia doesn't want to be squeezed out of the Middle East. Yes, Russia has, what, uh, two or three blue water ports outside Russia, but it's nothing in comparison to um, to the US, but as I said, the US will look at it that way, so in a sense, that idea, which is sort of the one, one version of Trotsky's idea, is very similar to what the US says. Not unsurprisingly, I suppose. The US will 
say that. The US is saying that Cuba is the main imperialist power in Venezuela, for God's sake. You know, like, <laughs> so, uh, I, this, I don't need to explain that, do I? You know, like, yes, there's a lot of Cubans in Venezuela, yes, but you know, uh, the Venezuelan government, although it's very close to Cuba, doesn't have even a lot of their policies are very, very different. You know, I've seen their health systems close up in both of them. They're very, they're very different what's going on in Venezuela. But, um, so the US will say that, and some Trotskyists will say that, but uh, I don't think we, we need to take it too seriously. An empire is, in, in simple terms, is a project of domination. And, you know, the Chinese um, using their economic muscle to, to get resources and land in Africa is not exactly the same thing. And Russia having a consensual agreements with Iraq and Syria and, uh, and Iran is not the same thing. But could it be argued that that's what they're building towards? Well, it may be. Maybe, you know, like uh, 30 years down the track, China will start to show the elements of an empire. I think some of the people, I know that China is certainly acts aggressively in its um, territorial disputes. You know, so if you're the Philippines or Japan or or, or, or um, you know, they're in some of those border areas, um, but uh, their behaviour, the Chinese behaviour in relation to international law, the Russian behaviour in international law is, um, and and that's important by the way because there are rules in terms of the system of sovereign states since 1945 at least. Um, you know, you can see that they don't project a form of exceptionalism in the way that the US does. They do think seriously and try and justify their positions in relation to international law and they have a much better case on international law. Okay, in some of the islands off China, they've gone against an ICJ ruling. You know, you'll find some exceptions, as I said, close to their borders where they're... Um, but um, in terms of international law, virtually everything that the US does in terms of sanctions is illegal. You know, their invasions, their funding of terrorist groups, they've been found against by the International Court of Justice in the 80s against Nicaragua, you know, that the, the, the violation of international law by the US are just legion. People have written books about it, William Bloom, the Rogue State, and others, you know. Um, so there's not really a serious comparison. Um, but you can't say maybe China may show the features of an empire down the track, but I would, I would say... This because that's really the fear, isn't it, that we don't really want to trade one hegemon or one empire for another. I mean, as a resistance... Yeah. And, and that's why the, the one of the key resistance themes in recent decades from Russia, from Venezuela, has been this idea of a multipolar world. That if we had a bipolar world in the Cold War, if we had this hegemonic dream of a single superpower after 1991 and had a unipolar world, we don't want to go back to a bipolar world or have a new hegemon, whichever language you want to use. But uh, Russia, uh, many of the Russian theorists and Hugo Chavez spoke quite a lot about this multipolar world, the idea of a multipolar world, um, where you don't have, even in terms of currency, you can see now that the, the relations that um, China is using, for example, are not to, they're using the yuan in trade, but they're not exclusively using it. They will, they are mainly doing bilateral swaps, you know, they will accept Brazilian, Argentinian, Russian currency um, for goods, you know, so they, they are not trying to impose, it's a burden too to have a single currency as the US found um, as a world currency. So the idea of a multipolar world sort of um, is, uh, is an important counter to that idea of going from one, uh, but, but, the world of imperialism or hegemonic stability thinks of that. There has to be a dominant power. If the US is not dominating here, then the Russians are going to take over, or the Chinese, or the Cubans are going to take over, or whoever it is. So watch Red Dawn, you know. Red Dawn tells you all about that. The Hollywood movie. Any other comments, Alex? The, the hegemonic powers have used really simplistic things to in their propaganda in their propaganda wars. And the uh, resistance has not been able to come up with the similar or, or, uh, way of fighting. Islamophobia is an example. I think Islamophobia is a tool being used 
Yes, very effectively, and particularly because they use it to diffuse criticism of their own particular nasty form of, of Islamism, basically. And they try and use it in that way. You're right, I think we have to acknowledge that the big power and their media organisations have been very effective. They have basically stupefied most of the Western populations into either cheering for their fake revolutions or, or just being worried and saying and doing nothing. People don't want to say something because they might say, oh, you're, you know, you support uh, uh, Nicolas Maduro or whoever the latest villain is, basically, you know. Um, you have to be critical of dictator Maduro or whoever the next one is, basically. So how, how, how do you find that? Is there a So we, uh, once again, we have to, our voices are very valuable, aren't they? I think we have to protect our voices, basically, uh, and use our voices and... The most effective way to do that follows this little scheme of resistance is that we have to join, find ways to join together in some way. <laughs> and using the media in Iran or the media in Russia or the media in or Kalisur, in, which is still a very, Kalisur is still a very good source of information about Venezuela, for example. Um, but Kalisur is a genuine continental um, media. There are some, there are some, uh, that's why there's such a reaction against RT and Russian television in, in the US, because it's a genuinely independent voice. Yes, of course, it reflects Kremlin foreign policy to an extent, but um, no more or less than uh, the, the Western media, Western corporate media reflects the, uh, the US foreign policy. So, so that, that variety is important. We have the internet. Um, we have to look at a way to combine those sorts of things and inform ourselves and inform others. I think you're right, it's a weak point that the, the, the US has been very effective in, in silencing people. In, in silencing this is a thing that has bothered me for a long time, as an educator, that they silence the most highly educated populations in human history. They fooled them, they fooled us quite a lot. Um, they fooled us, you know, they, and they, they fool us repeatedly. Uh, it surprised me to see, you know, after the Iraq war and, and it became very publicly known that this was a false pretext. They would just do it all over again with Libya, with Syria, mm -hmm. Venezuela, with Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. it's fake. Um, it seems like imperialism and neoliberalism are very well-defined concepts. But if you use them in relation to your colleagues who are scholars in your field, you say you're imperialist, you're neoliberal. They get very upset and hostile, and I'm sure probably imperialism is very delicate and sensitive because of work here, probably the report that he insulted everybody, Americans, Australians, British, Europeans. What would be nicer words to use? <laughs> to, well, the problem to, is to, 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 people don't like being called names. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first problem. How, how yeah. can we say, how can we say these concepts that are causing... Talk about their ideas rather than them. Instead of saying, what are you saying? Neoliberal ideas here, my friend. Not that you were a neoliberal. That's one thing. But I think there's some very big contradictions between liberalism and, and imperialism these days. I've tried to point it out there. You know that most of this stuff, most war is very illiberal for a start, but also the economic war involves massively illiberal ideas. But somehow, you know, if you want to criticise someone or call something to their attention, be more specific about it rather than rather than um, drawing it together into an accusation. Perhaps, you know. Yes, so I, I think you know one of the things is that we need to make sure that I mean we do not follow the main media or the corporate media, the state media. Uh, so and look for the alternatives in regards to the media to inform ourselves because informing ourselves will be will we are able or capable to, to inform others or to challenge uh, and to debate, um, you know, those who come with the, with the hegemonic, you know, language or the language of, of, of the, the imperial power. The other thing is to find the niche, you know, the groups that where we can unite. I mean, at the moment, you know, Facebook is, is, is a major thing for many of the of the activists, but I also I mean there is VK and um, there is the alternative media that sort of access those and sort of, you know, kind of 
and fine uh, groups. I mean, we have, in, in the past, we have managed to have large groups like the anti-war movement with the, with the uh, campaign against the war in Iraq, and that was easy to kind of join when it was really popular. But it was really difficult when the, when the campaign, you know, by the U.S. Um, against Syria, it was really difficult to find, you know, the voice, the group. But eventually, you know, we found, some of us found those niche and, and, and we became the alternative media. We became the alternative voice to the, you know, encounter and, and as much as we could uh, the main propaganda war that was carried against uh, uh, Syria. Unfortunately, Yemen now is being destroyed and nothing is happening. And, and, hap and glad enough now, fortunate enough, is that we are hearing voices uh, in support of Venezuela because we know that there is uh, another war propaganda against Venezuela. So we need to, uni we need to try to find those uh, areas where we can unite and amal amalgamate uh, um, against the empire, against the war propaganda. Thank you. Um, look, I want to thank everyone for coming along tonight for this first seminar. And um, can you please hand this one back in? Uh, leave your email in the book there, or on this piece of paper if you like, if you want to be informed about future talks. Of course, we have one, another one in this pilot series with Jay next week talking about the war in Yemen and the, the role of the arms industry in Australia in relation, particularly in relation to the war in Yemen. Um, thanks very much for coming along, folks. Thank you.